Hi, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Global Health. Today on TWIG, we are going to be covering measles, and I'm sure in no short order, vaccinations as well. Um, to get things started off, let's do a brief introduction. Greg Martin can't be with us today. Uh, I'm Chris Ronson. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, California, and I'm going to be helping cover the broad spectrum of measles discussion and conversation topics that we're going to have today. Um, let me start off by introducing Brian. Sure. Hi, Brian Simpson with Global Health Now at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. It's 2 o'clock. I'll be giving you a couple uh, news stories from the week and then also sort of the lead-in news for the measles discussion that will be happening later. Thank you. Excited to hear all about that content and about that symposium. Um, Ms. Jackson? <laughs> you know that it's going to be, I'm sorry, Ms. Jackson, next. Exactly. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Katie Jackson, and I'm coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden, where it is very dark and late out right now. Um, and I uh, just wanted to let everyone know if they have any questions about measles or vaccines or anything during the show, you can tweet at us at TWIGH hashtag or at Tweak Team. We like answering those questions. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Jeff? Hey everyone, I'm Jessica Taff. I'm coming to you from the Washington DC metro area. Today, like everyone else, we'll be talking about measles and I'll particularly be telling you an interesting fact about it. And then I'll, get, I'll give you some background on the MMR controversy that is uh, kind of responsible for why we have some measles outbreaks going on. Okay, and last but not least, Sulzan. Hey everybody, this is Sulzan. I'm speaking to you from North Carolina and I'll be discussing the economic side of the measles outbreak. So, looking forward. Awesome. There's a part of me that really, really just wants to quote all of the things and the transitions that Greg makes, but I'm going to try not to. Um, so, let's see. And just like Katie said, please tweet at us. You can go to our website if you're watching this live on YouTube or at twig.org. Thank you so much. Please send us your questions and uh, any other information that you'd like us to know, like your feedback. And we also just started an Instagram, at twig team. And, uh, yeah, Brian, I'm going to send it over to you. Okay, great. So a couple stories that caught my eye this week, and I want to look, make sure everybody knows that so these are not scientific story uh, uh, results in terms of number of hits per story or anything like that, but these are stories that I think are interesting and worth commenting on. So the first one is uh, two more cases of MERS w was reported in, so in Saudi Arabia, and WHO is uh, sort of urging us stepped up infection control in hospitals in Saudi Arabia uh, as the there seems to be sort of a persistent kind of hospital uh, hospital related infections uh, with MERS uh, so they've got up to up to now 857 cases and 366 deaths so it's uh, WHO is concerned about the possibility of an internet international spread uh, so far it's still kind of localized to Saudi Arabia but we'll we'll kind of keep that keep our eyes on that and the second story that I thought was really interesting was um, was covered by uh, Sarah Bosley in The Guardian, and it's the plight of the jobless uh, and increased rates of suicide for uh, unemployed people. So a uh, researcher was able to uh, figure out their, or, you know, sort of do the research and find out that there are 45,000 suicides every year uh, amongst uh, unemployed uh, people. So it's it's that that connection between, you know, loss of employment and uh, and suicide. So I think one of the interesting implications was that was in terms of steering uh, steering sort of in interventions toward uh, recently unemployed people to reduce suicide. So I thought that was a, you know, another yeah. kind of interesting story. Brian, can I interrupt you just for a moment? I just want to comment on the MERS thing. Um, ironically, I was just writing about that this morning, so I'm kind of up to date on it. Um, I'm glad that you're bringing that to everyone's attention because I, I and the CDC put out an alert at end of last month, it was like January 29th, saying, you know, everyone keep vigilant, keep watch, because the, the cases are still emerging. And then there was just another, there was a, um, WHO had convened together, and they basically said it's not a public health emergency of international concern yet, but I think people really should continue to, to watch this, because it could. It, you know, it's, it's something we really need to keep vigilant about. Yeah. Exactly, and it was certainly you know in the recent months overshadowed by Ebola, but you know there's it's still that kind of a threat out there that needs to be kind of on everybody's radar. So yeah, uh, I think if we've learned anything from both Ebola and measles, it's that no disease really pays attention to or cares at all about boundaries, differences between people, different ethnic groups. So there's always that risk, and that's important to keep in mind. And uh, Francis Collins, director of NIH, will sing to you about that. Disease has no borders. <laughs> Truth, okay. truth, look it up. 
Great. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to um, sort of our kind of news lead in to the measles discussion. Uh, here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health on Monday, we had a half day symposium on measles, and we heard from uh, a lot of experts in terms of not only about the virus itself, but then also, um, you know, prevention measures, vaccine issues, vaccine safety, um, and a couple of the key points that, that the highlights that came to me were uh, the that the CDC's Jane Seward uh, pointed out that measles deaths have uh, decreased by 75% since 1980 uh, worldwide measles deaths, uh, and which is a you know pretty astounding fact, uh, testament to the effectiveness of the vaccine and expanding vaccine coverage. Uh, now the challenge is that of course there's still you know millions of measles cases out there, and for the from the U.S. perspective, uh, there's always sort of constant and frequent uh, importations of cases. So it's, uh, it's kind of like the virus is always sort of testing our uh, public health system and the public health response. And as we all know, because there's so many uh, micro communities of vaccine hesitant or vaccine reluctant uh, people who are refusing the vaccine for their children, uh, the, it's very easy as we've seen for measles to get a toehold in, in the communities, especially where those vaccination coverage rates are low. Um, and Jane Seward said that, you know, when measles happens anywhere in the world, it can come here on a plane and spread very quickly. So as, as you pointed out, it's like, yeah, there are, it does not respect borders. So I, the other key message I got in terms of response for the U.S. and sort of turning the tide on the epidemic and preventing you know, future outbreaks is um, the importance of really reaching out for public health to reach out to the vaccine hesitant crowd to kind of really meet them where they are understand their motivations and be able to come up with a communication strategy that sort of will effectively kind of meet their meet their concerns. Um, also on the list are revising policies for vaccine exemptions in the US and working closely with the healthcare providers and doctors because that's where a lot of these sort of crucial conversations happen. I think that sounds like it was an amazing and really comprehensive symposium. So we're going to include the link to uh, sort of the telecast or the webcast of that in the show notes. People can catch up because it's going to end up being a really, really important resource for anybody who's interested in both the policy of it and about the subject of measles in general. So thank you so much, Brian. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And I'll be signing off from Baltimore now. All right. See you next week. Okay. See you next week. Okay, so there's obviously no denying that measles is uh, a big issue in the news right now and something that a lot of people are talking about, very controversial. So we, again, wanted to dedicate this episode to the topic of measles. Just to give everybody a little bit of background, uh, measles is a highly contagious respiratory disease and it causes rash, or it sort of uh, manifests as rashes, coughs, runny nose, and high fevers. Uh, complications of measles can lead to uh, illnesses like in, um, wow, like pneumonia, encephalitis, deafness, and even go so far as death. An important fact to remember is that from 2001 to 2013, 28% or, you know, one quarter of children under the age of five who were infected with measles had to be treated for complications in the hospital. So it has some very serious implications. Wow, um, that's a big number. Um, talking about how measles spread, so measles is an airborne disease uh, caused by paramyxovirus. Now, this virus, interestingly, can live on fomite or non-living objects for up to two hours. And just to put this into context as well, one person with measles can infect 90% of people around him or her. And comparing this with other diseases in the news, or when you look at the basic repro reproductive rate, or r naught, which is the number of people one infected individual can uh, infect, uh, you know, uh, for measles, that number is 12 to 18. So one person can infect 12 to 18 other non-infected people. So I'm so glad that you brought the r naught up, I get, because this is something that's really important. I think we were first introduced to it during the Ebola outbreak. Um, people were under, trying to understand what reproduction values meant. And wow, you know, 12 to 18, if you think about how that compares to the reproductive number for influenza, which is four, or Ebola, it's two, it's amazing that we haven't, we're just letting this thing go as it is. It's so much more transmissible. It's so much more dangerous in terms of the sense of how many people it can reach just from one outbreak. So true. We're so harsh about quarantining about Ebola, but really lax yeah. when it comes to measles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really crazy. And, um, 
actually it's a really good makes it a really good candidate for a vaccine. And the measles vaccine was actually introduced in 1963, and it led to remarkable changes in the incidence of measles, as we've seen. Uh, measles is currently given as an MMR, which is uh, a combination vaccine to protect against measles. Uh, mumps and rubella and children are vaccinated with two doses the first one is between 12 and 15 months and the second dose between four and six years the MMR vaccine is so effective it covers 97 percent protection against the disease so it's really quite effective and you know this is a great place for me to kind of bring up the controversy that well, maybe a lot of people are familiar with um, that the MMR vaccine causes autism. In fact, it's the reason why a lot of people don't want to vaccinate their children, and this is the reason why we have these outbreaks going on. But let me give you some background on it. Okay. So in 1998, there was a study by Dr. Andrew Wakefield that was published in Lancet, and it claimed that there was a link between autism and the measles vaccine. But sadly, no one decided to bother checking the data. And not only was the study based on a low sample size of 12 people, that's really small guys, uh, but also the data was discovered to be fraudulent. Now, the paper, luckily, was retracted by Lancet in 2010, as they should have done, and Wakefield, it was so severe, Wakefield actually lost his medical license. But by then, it was too late, because people kind of already bought into this, this urban legend of the MMR vaccine causes autism. Now, this is really, really important, because vaccinations work on the concept of herd immunity. And this means that in order for a disease to be eradicated, most of the population has to be vaccinated. So as the vaccination percentage drops, the risk of an outbreak increases. So hopefully this, you guys can, you know, our viewers can understand why this is a real issue if we're, just, if we're not getting the appropriate coverage of vaccination. And this is why we're having these outbreaks pop up. Oh, so, oh, yeah. I get Somebody does it every show. Every show. Every show. <laughs> every show. This is my second, though. I feel like I'm not learning. Um, but it's really important to think about uh, these ideas when you think about vaccines for the Im herd immunity. Because there's some people that can't actually get vaccines. So uh, immunocompromised people or even children that are under the year of one that haven't gotten the vaccination yet. These are really crucial um, populations already without the added bonus or added bonus, added <laughs> risk of contracting one of these diseases. So <laughs> not a bonus. It's really important. Not a bonus. Take that back. Not a bonus. Um, so it's really important to think about these populations too. When you think about herd immunity, there are some people that are not able to be covered. And if you do not get the vaccination, you are putting them at risk as well. That's that's so interesting. Um, like, and a very valid point, Katie. Um, especially like, you know, obviously measles, a vaccine had, uh, has really reduced the numbers. However, still, according to World Health Organization, 145 thousand and seven hundred uh, measles deaths occurred in 2013. Now that's 400 deaths every day and 16 deaths per hour due to measles. A shocking statistic considering it costs less than one dollar to immunize a child for measles. And, and it's really incredible we talk about measles like this and actually measles had been eradicated uh, in the US uh, in 2000 so we didn't have any measles at all and misinformation and celebrity endorsements of self-professed anti-vaccines campaigners such as <laughs> Jenny McCarthy um, <laughs> my favorite person ever has led to a re-emergence of the disease that we've already eradicated in the country so measles has hit two contrasting settings this year one setting was in Disneyland California and the other setting was in refugee camps in northeast Nigeria so just really an incredible contrast in this outbreak the US is currently experiencing multiple state outbreak that started in Disneyland around Christmas and has already spread to 15 states and Mexico with a confirmed 102 cases that's within a one-month period that's what we've gotten to Wow that's that's a big number and, yeah. and it's interesting that you bring up Mexico because interestingly uh, Mexico achieved elimination of measles way back in 96 and have maintained that without any variability However, once in a while, you do get uh, an imported case of measles from Mexico, which interestingly comes from the United States to Mexico, usually. Shame on us. Shame on us. Endangering Mexico. I know, I know. So talking about measles outbreak and the economic cost, now, measles outbreak not only impacts the people who are infected, but also the taxpayers by imposing significant economic burden on health systems. So, for example, I was reading the study uh, by CDC, uh, which was published in Vaccine, which estimated that the economic cost of measles in 2011, with 107 cases, was approximately 5 million U.S. dollars. Number, huh? 
That's another huge number, and I think it's important to note that the economic burden of the current outbreak is projected to get much greater, obviously, if we don't contain or put this under control, do the right uh, education on measles and vaccinations in general. Um, it's disheartening that people have become a little bit complacent about it, I think, since it doesn't seem to be one of those overwhelming or looming fears. Um, and people have also been misinformed. So just something for everybody to keep in mind is that measles is preventable with the MMR vaccine. As we said, there's a 97% efficacy rate. And it's usually in most countries free for administration, and that includes the United States. So everyone go out there and do it. <laughs> so we're talking about measles in the United States, but uh, let's talk about measles around the world. So last year we saw 57,000 cases of measles in Philippines and China, and there were outbreaks in countries such as Nigeria, Angola, Brazil. But interestingly, U.S. is not the only high-income country struggling with measles this year. 254 cases of measles have been reported in Germany this year in an outbreak which is supposed to be 10 times much worse than the one in U.S. Yeah, and I would just like to, to, uh, to make note too that there's an article just saying that as far as the um, number of people infected with measles in relationship to the population, that's where that magnitude of the 10 times greater comes out. So it's more the seriousness in the ratio of the population to the number of cases. So. In case anyone is concerned about the data or the numbers, there you go. There's a little bit more context. Um, do you have yeah, anything that you wanted right. to add to that, Jessica? Yeah, no, I do, because I think it's important to note that the reemergence of measles in high-income countries is linked to the historical success. Chris, you were kind of talking a little bit about this, but the historical success of the vaccine that happened also with rising ignorance about vaccination. So, like you said, people don't think of these diseases very much. They're not seeing them, so they're not thinking they're really a problem. I mean, they, people, a lot of, like, I never grew up with these sorts of things, um, and I'm kind of dating myself, maybe, or not, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm saying I'm young, let's go with that. Uh, anyway, but yeah, like, for instance, a lot of people don't understand that you can go blind with measles, you can become sterile, or you can die from whooping cough, so, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, unfortunately, but we can't let that happen. Right. And before I go into my next point, I have been corrected. So uh, I've actually said eradicated, that the U.S. had eradicated measles, and it's eliminated. So thanks, shout out to Jason Tetro, uh, a.k.a. the germ guy, uh, for correcting me on Twitter so that I don't spread some more misinformation. Uh, we know that's already happened in measles. Um, but also to keep going, uh, not many people realize actually that measles was responsible for killing one-third of the native populations of Hawaii and Fiji when it was introduced there in the late 19th century, a.k.a. we brought them measles and they hadn't previously been uh, exposed to it. So just really interesting there as well. Wow. Didn't that happen with smallpox uh, as well? It killed uh, much of native population in uh, right. the Incas. Wow. Right. So um, talking about like, again, like being on the same topic, um, according to CDC, we need like a 92% vaccination rate for measles, uh, you know, to maintain the herd immunity that Jessica talked about earlier in the show. Now, many lower income countries have more than 92% measles vaccination rate. So this whole fear about, you know, it's going to come from other countries. Uh, so, for example, Tanzania where is a country where 99% of population is vaccinated against measles is like, you know, really high compared to a high income country such as Austria, which had 75% immunization rate against measles, ranks just above countries such as Afghanistan and actually below Sierra Leone. And in major contrast to that, 91% of children in the U.S. are vaccinated against measles. But as we mentioned before, numbers vary state to state and county to county. Um, an interesting phenomenon related to the current outbreak that originated in Orange County, which has sort of become known as the Disneyland incident, which never ever thought that that would be a phrase, uh, is that the demographic families with the lowest rates of vaccination are actually the ones with the highest socioeconomic st economic status as well as being wow. ethnically white. Um, so as a result, the poor and low income families are carrying the herd immunity of the rest of the population, which is a really surprising statistic. We talked about how it's sort of that out of sight, out of mind mindset, um, but we talk about how we have we, are, we have the benefit of having these great public health infrastructures and having these systems that work for us and then compared to countries with Sierra Leone that are obviously back on the mend from um, Ebola right. and a number of other internal issues have higher vaccination rates. Um, it's with this that I'm going to go ahead and take us out for the uh, this part of the show, the live show. We're going to go into the discussion section next. But if, again, you're listening to us on podcast, watching us on twig.org or for YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll end the show now, but we're going to take questions from the audience in the next section. So if you have time to stick around, please do.
Thanks, everyone.